I trust you brought your Bibles with you this morning. I invite you to take it and turn with me to Luke 13, verse 6, verse 27. Luke 13, verse 27. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where you, where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for the beautiful music. And Roberta, thank you for a wonderful story. And to add that personal little testimony was special. Thank you. Okay, we were just reading in, um, in Luke 13, um, 27. And uh, the words that I never want to hear, especially at the end of my life or at the end of time, is depart from me, I know you not. I'd want to be known as a doer of iniquity, and I certainly don't want God to rec not recognize me as someone who loves him. But we know that there's things in our lives that cause us to be distracted and for us to lose our way. And my prayer is today that I can present it properly that we'll know and understand that there is something that's standing in our way of salvation. And it's not because of God. And it's not because we're not willing. It's because there's a missing piece of the puzzle. And I'm hopefully that we'll unravel that. Uh, Desire of Ages 825, I started to read and I got to the whole end of that, that um, page, and it's like, it goes for like two pages in my book. And I thought, well, where is this, you know, I know you not. I mean, I, it was the very last sentence in there. And I thought that this was really something that, um, that I needed to read. I needed to read all of, of that, 825. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Father, we do want to thank you for the blessings that you've given to us so far. And we ask now for a blessing during this time of the service. We pray that you'd give me courage and to um, give me the words that come from you and not from something that I've written down for myself or some point that I'm trying to make for myself, but only the things that you've impressed me to write. And we pray that those that are here that would hear it would be blessed and that their lives would be changed and that they would only see Jesus and his soon coming and that they would have courage to know that they would not be among the, the people that would have to hear that, I know you not. We ask this blessing in Christ's name, amen. Well, you might say, or some people might say, who does he think he is? That's pretty, that's pretty tough, you know, depart from me, you doer of iniquity. I mean, who does this person think he is? Oh, let's say... How about if we turn that around and say, who do we think we are? And not question God and his sovereignty. That would be the better way to put it. But a lot of people question God. And they don't want anything to do with God. Because they see him as being someone who's exacting and harsh. I don't see that as being harsh at all. I see it being the culmination of my life. As God has presented me a different way of living, I've chose not to go down that path. Um, Let's, let's read in uh, Matthew 7, uh, 21 through 23, if you'll turn to that. Matthew 21, 7, 21 through 23. Well, I've lost my page here. Hang on just a minute. I'm not nervous. It just appears that way. Okay, 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done so many wonderful works? 
And then I will profess to them that I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know, many places in the Bible, it, it, it makes this statement that God wants a certain thing of our life, and it's only our heart. <laughs> it's not a big thing, and yet we find it difficult to give it to him completely. So what really matters is not what you think of yourself, it's what God thinks of you. And he sent his son, he thinks so much of you that he sent his only begotten son to die for me and for you. So that's how much he thinks of you. So when you've done something wrong, you think God must think very little of me. No, he thinks a lot of you. It's Satan who wants you to think that God doesn't like you and that you're unworthy. Do you really know who you are? Do you know all about yourself? Or do we stick our head in the sand and we pretend that we're okay? We go to church and we're safe and secure in the arms of Jesus and we do all of the churchy things. We do all the things that we know that we think will please God. We read, we study, we pray, we attend church. But what about our character? Is our character really like the character of God? Or like Jesus, reflect Jesus' character? We need to think that thing through. Because there's the, there's the stopping point. Is that though we're doing all of these things, just like the people are saying here in, in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out devils? We've seen that in church. In churches all around the world. And have we done a lot of good deeds for God? We have. But there, there's something that leads God to say to us, depart from me, I know you not. That's a pretty heavy statement. That's a pretty heavy statement to know. This is the first time I've written on small cards, so I'm sorry, I'm struggling a little bit this morning. Usually I have myself a great mint card that I can read. won't make that mistake again. Is there anything that's not sacred anymore? It seems like we, we take things, liberties, too many liberties, like we say, uh, uh, young people today will say, and I've even said it myself, that, you know, Jesus is my best friend. Well, that's nice to say, and it's nice you feel that way, but he is the, the co-creator of the universe. He is God's son. He is the son of God. He is God. He's part of the Godhead, and as such, we should respect him as that. We, we had an incident here not too long ago. Somebody said, uh, oh, you know old Tommy? Tommy's a good buddy of mine. I said, oh, really? I said, you talking about Judge Stewart? Judge Stewart? Is that what they call him? I call him Tommy. Well, that's great because he's a personal friend of his, but now everybody in this little town wants to call the judge old Tommy. Like they're, they're his best friend. Now, when they get in front of old Tommy, Tommy may have to pass down a verdict that they don't like. He could have gone a little bit softer on them, but he knows and understands etiquette, protocol, whatever you want to say. But I'm saying that we have gone astray when it comes to giving God the glory. We treat glory as something we've heard in a song. And those are all fine and well. But deep in our heart, do we have a place in, in our mind and in our heart to know that God is sovereign, that he's holy, he's above all of this, and yet we don't address him as the true God of heaven. It's almost like he's the Santa Claus. Could you, could you heal this? Could you do that? And my car is almost broke down, and you know I, I need this, I need this. We, just, we have a lot of needs. And he wants to supply the needs to his family. He loves his children. But how far have we come away from being uh, recognizing like the pastor? It, it's nice that, that people would say, uh, Daniel is our pastor. Or, or that I, 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 really, I really like Dan. Well, that's fine. Dan has a name. My name is Jim. I don't, I don't expect people to call me Elder Jim or Elder Martin. But we've gotten so far away from it that we don't even call people by their proper name, which is respect that's due to them. And that's not a problem in as much as us as human beings communicating with each other. But we've got to know everybody on a first name basis. Not Mr. and Mrs. McGillicuddy. Jane and Jack. 
You know, that's who they know. And so we're treating God with the same disrespect, honestly. And there's a reason for that. And we need to get away from that. So nothing, nothing is really sacred anymore. Um, Jesus is not our best bud. He's our Lord and our Savior, our Redeemer. And as such, he deserves more than just, you know, he's my buddy. I hang with him, you know. That, that is sort of a new term that people say. And, and that might give them some, some pleasure or something, but that's not what God is or who God is. Little by little, the Israelites slipped into idolatry. They didn't just wake up one morning and the priests come out and said, okay, we're doing something new this week. We're going to start worshiping idols. Is everybody with me on this? That would not have happened. But little by little, things crept into the camp. They got lazy. They weren't studying the word. It was easier for them to go kill a lamb than to quit sinning. What did God say in the scriptures? Many times I've read different things that said, you know, I, I don't care about all these bulls and all these calves and all these lambs and all this blood that's being spilled. This, you, you, you guys have got the wrong concept of, of what the sacrificial service is all about. It's pointing to my son. It's not pointing to uh, the church that I formerly went to. They didn't condone sin, but they had little confessionals that you could go to to come and confess your sins. And then I find myself and my buddies were going back out and doing the same thing again next week. It was sort of like a, a, a revolving door, like a revolving credit deal, you know. You come in and get filled with the credit, and then you go back out and spend it, and get out, filled with the credit, and get back out and spend it again. And that's not what God meant when he says that you should confess your sins, but not to a man. You said you can fe- confess your faults one to another. But anyway, this is where we've ended up. So the Israelites did not start out with our idolatry. It was like a creeping compromise. It just started taking hold here and there and there until people got to the point where they were just done to the fact and it was just part of what they did. Then God had to bring in an invading army, had to do away with them, take them into captivity. They'd repent. They'd become God's number one people again and he'd rebuild the temple and they, all this thing, they hear come an invading army and now this time now he took the people away. They also took the gold, the silver, the chalice and everything else so they could use it for what? So they could worship God with it? No, no, that wasn't the point. So there's a little common thread that's running through all of this, and it's called Satan. And how many people know what uh, the phrase is, there's a chink in your armor? Does anybody know that? Have you ever heard that phrase? Many have, okay. So for those that don't know, what, in the military when we say, I'm going to find the chink in his armor, that means there's a soft spot, something that can harm him. Uh, I, I used to hear or read stories about uh, knights and their fighting. And uh, the, the guy would always, he, the winner was always looking at people from a distance watching. And he would see that the, the chain that was holding up the breastplate above the heart was just a little bit saggy. So that's the first place he went for because that was the chink in the armor. That was the weak spot. And if he could thrust his sword in there, it'd all be over with. And there wouldn't be any fighting going on, it'd just be over with. And so Satan knows the chink in my armor. He is not concerned at this point in my life or in your life about your spirituality and the strengths of your spirituality. You could be in very good standing in the church. You could be an elder, a pastor, a layperson in charge of children's department. It makes no difference what you're doing. And you're doing a lot of good work. And God loves to have faithful people working. Satan is not concerned. He's not going to attack that because you'll fight that off. But where he's going to go, he's going to go where you have a chink in your armor. That's those words of disparaging remarks that you might make to somebody or you might talk falsely about somebody or whatever the thing is. makes no difference what it is. That's your chink. And as long as we have that and we don't take it to God and ask for forgiveness and lay it all on the altar and say, I cannot handle this issue in my life. I thought I could cover it up. I thought I could just walk away from it. I was hoping it wouldn't come up again. You can use all of those lame excuses. But that doesn't cover that because he's waiting for that proper moment and he knows you better than you know yourself. That's why I say, do you know, really know who you are? We need to examine ourselves. Don't be examining everybody else in the church or everybody else in the community 
are judged by the church they go to or the clothes that they wear or the car that they drive. My mom used to have a saying that I didn't understand when I was little. It said, you need to sweep off your own doorstep before you criticize the neighbor's dirt on their doorstep. I thought, why is she talking about that? But then as I grew older, I realized that that was, was a true statement. So why would you feel that, um, that the children of Israel would have gone into idolatry? They had a form of godliness. They had a temple that was, that was um, built by human hands, but by God's design. They had every ordinance that God gave that was pure and beautiful and uplifting, and even left a little, a little area for the forgiveness of sin, because people are human and they're going to sin. So how did that happen? They didn't examine themselves personally. They're always worried about, you didn't keep that law, and I'm going to turn you into the, into the Jewish leaders. And so they started fighting. And then the, then the people who were in leadership, they wanted to fight amongst themselves because they were smarter than everybody else. And they didn't like anybody, especially if you were a Gentile. But what did God have in mind? That all men would be saved, not just the Israelites every man so we surely have a form of godliness and we know better than to deny the power and it says in 2 Timothy 3 5 our righteousness is truly like filthy rags if you go to Isaiah 64 let's take a minute to do that I would Isaiah 60, 64 6 if you turn in your Bibles you've heard this thing a lot but it's really important 64.6 But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness as his filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have been taken, take, carried us away or taken us away. If we don't have a need in any area of our life or if there is one need we need more than anything and that is to recognize that Christ's righteousness is what we have to have. We have no way. You can study the scriptures all the way through. You can know 10 different languages. I know of a person who recently has said over and over that the Bible doesn't really mean a whole bunch to them because it's just one religious perspective. He said, I'm a reader of, of uh, world religions. And he said, I glean from all of them. And he said, there's no way you'll ever prove to me that God, your God, or your Jesus, is the only way to salvation. Because I know, I practice some, a little bit here of this, of this, that, and another. So here's a man who's even way ahead of me in the game, and he speaks like six different languages, three of them fluently, and he writes like that, and yet he has no need, has no need of God at all. So our righteousness are filthy rags, and here's a guy who has gone into other religions and, and knows them well. You can't, you can't, you can't uh, turn his boat around on any subject because he, he knows it and you don't. And he knows you don't know it. So <laughs> that's, that's somebody he has to contend with. And we're trying to win him, so be praying for that. Um, in, in, in one of the parables, and, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but... You know, when the king called out and told his servants to go out and to invite people to the, to the wedding. And he went out and one guy said, well, I just bought some oxen and I'm going to have to go prove them. Well, what do you mean you need to go prove them? You've already bought them. So what's the proving point? You just don't want to go to the wedding. Another guy says, uh, well, <clears throat> I, uh, I just bought some land and... Uh, and I need to go approve of it. Well, why would you go buy land <laughs> if you haven't approved of it yet? So that's another ridiculous, lame excuse. Now, the best one I thought was, I thought, well, that, surely that's excusable, this next one, and that is I just got married, and I need to be home with my wife. Well, that's a pretty lame excuse, too, because the king would have welcomed a newlywed couple to come to the wedding. Just because he invited the man doesn't mean his wife was not accepted. In fact, would probably be pretty much showcased and said, hey, here's another young couple who just recently married. You know? So they go out in the highways and byways and finally people just get annoyed with them and kill a few of them. 
And uh, so they come back, and whatever, one person can come back and tell the king, he said, you know, they wiped out all the people that told about the wedding. He said, that's okay, go out to the highways and byways. And you get everybody, anybody that can come, bring them. So one guy, and there's several different passages in the scripture, and I'm, I'm mixing a few of them together for the sake of making a point. So the wedding is set, and all the festivities start, and the king gazes out there, and here's one guy in just regular old street clothes. And everybody else has been given a robe. Now, we're going we're gonna to suggest here at this point that you've gotten the robe of Christ's righteousness. It's been given to you. It's a free gift. Please come to the wedding of the Lamb. I'm inviting you personally. Please come to the wedding of the Lamb. So here's this robe. If you'll put on Christ's righteousness, then, then you're welcome to come. So this guy comes in his street clothes. And he's sitting over there. And the king says, excuse me, who are you and why are you dressed that way? And the guy's like really silent, like, uh-oh, it's up. So in this case, um, I wouldn't usually say things in common language, but, but no party crasher is allowed, okay? God is not going to allow there to be a mixed multitude or a mixture of people in that wedding. You either have Christ's righteousness or you don't have it because our righteousness is as filthy rags, just like the man that wasn't dressed properly. And so what happened to him? Did he give him a robe and say, now you go back there and change? That was it. You bind him up hand and foot, and you throw him in outer darkness, and he says, and there will be gnashing of teeth. Now that's scary, folks. I mean, that's scary for me. At 2 o'clock this morning, I'm thinking, okay, um, I get and understand that, but how do I articulate that and put it into some practical terms? And that is just plain out, if we're not ready, we're not ready. And, 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 and another thing that we would hear as kids is say we play games called ready or not, here I come. But God has given us plenty of time not to play hide and seek, but to be found. Christ came of his own free will. From the foundations of the world, there were other universes. Christ would visit with all the other planets, and all the other people all over the universe. And they had such a beautiful thing going in the Garden of Eden, and they wanted to have something special. All these other places were already built, already designed, and no sin. And Satan now has control, if you will, his dominion, so that means he has control. And so God only asked man to do one thing, and that's to be obedient and not to do a certain task. Just one simple task. Not a bunch of, there wasn't ten commandments, there was only one tree. So it was only one commandment. Thou shalt not eat of this tree. Okay? And Satan knew the chink in Eve's armor. He also anticipated the chink in Adam's armor. He knew that if he could separate those two for just even a brief moment of time and in strategy and war and I've learned this many many times is you separate and you conquer divide and conquer when we had hard tasks to take care of we took care of the smallest task first got it out of the way moved the second task moved it out of the way so on and so forth you didn't go in there with an agenda of a lot of things there was just there was just one objective and that was to win the day and move on, okay? Which brings me to a short story. Um, In the Navy, on Guam, and uh, had a large marine uh, population there, and there was always a lot of um, rivalry between the commanders of the Marine Corps and the Navy. And though we lived together, we ate together, we played together, we also had opposing views on how war should be fought, and sometimes they'd have mock wars. But anyway, the Marines were, were challenging one another, and how many people know what a punji stick is? Does anybody? You know, okay. So you've seen the punji stick with a big ball on it. Usually a punji stick is just a large bar, and you would stand on a log, and, or in, in, in combat, <laughs> you would take that and do your enemy in. But in, uh, in practice, you would have a great big... Uh, uh, canvas ball on there. It'd be tied tied on the stick, and there'd be one at one end and one at the other. It looked like little lightweight barbells. Okay, 
And usually you stand on a log and you challenge each other. And you try to knock each other out if you could, but if at least knock you off the log. That was the main point, is to disable you. And so the Navy guys would go, watch this, because these guys were warriors. These guys were hardened battle warriors, got back to Vietnam, and they want to have some fun. So they were doing this punji competition, and they did it every week. So I just sit there and I'd watch, and I kept watching people. And it didn't dawn on me until last night when I was studying that what I was looking for was the chink in someone's armor. I never thought of it that way until I started writing. But a couple of the Navy guys were pretty good, and uh, they, uh, they said, I'd like to you know, challenge the winner of that last go-round. And they did, and they won a few sessions. But little by little, they all got wiped out. So they said, what about you? And I said, oh, I'm just observing. You know, I'm just a little guy. I'm not going to do anything rash. And so then the next week, I kept watching this one guy, and I called him the little giant. He was probably five, six, five, seven, very thinly built, but he was fast like lightning, and he was extremely strong. And some of the biggest guys would come up to him, and they'd just really nail him, and he just wouldn't even move on that log. It's like, it's like little springs in his legs. But I noticed that every time he got off the log after he won, he'd knock him out or he'd knock him off. He'd always go over to massage his feet. Oh, just really hurt. And so anyway, he's off by himself. I thought, that's strange. I didn't think much of it. But then I got the urge to be brave. And it was at the end of the competition after a couple of weeks. And this guy was the only guy standing as the champion. Now, if you go against the champion, you have to go three rounds. Two out of three. So that makes it fair because you might slip off the log and that wouldn't be fair. So anyway, I said, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to take my try. Or I said, I'd like to have a go at it. And, and he laughed. <laughs> he said, you got to be kidding, you scrawny little sailor. He said, I'll wipe you off the face of the earth about that quick. He said, come on up here so I can knock you out. I want to go and eat. And I kind of thought of him last night as like Goliath looking at David. Though he was little in stature himself, no one messed with him because this guy was tough. And so anyway, I called him the little giant, but then I realized last night, well, that's actually what Goliath did, laughing at David. And I didn't go there in the name of the Lord. I went there in the, in the name of foolishness and, and, to, and just to see what would happen. And I wasn't afraid of getting hurt. But I remembered his feet. Every time he got off the log, when he won, he'd go massage his feet. So he took a couple of great big stabs at me, and he swung that thing around, and he hit me in the head, almost knocked me off the log, almost knocked some sense into me at this point. Senseless, maybe. But anyway, I thought, okay, now's the time. So he stopped back and he laughed. I lunged forward and I hit him right in the ankle. Then I took the other side and went down across his other foot and knocked his feet out right from underneath him. And he fell off that log and he goes, huh, come on, get back up here. <laughs> I know what you're up to. And I said, no, I only came out here to demonstrate that I had the courage to do it and you're the champion and I walked away. I didn't, I didn't continue. I knew that I wasn't strong enough to, to meet the task. But I knew that I had to do something just because I had it in my mind. I think I can do this. So I, didn't, I never really put it together. This has been 45 years ago. And I just put it together last night. But I was actually observing what bothered him the most. Just like they taught us, look for the chink in someone else's armor. So I don't know if that plays into the sermon for you or not. But this is what Satan does to us. He's watching you constantly. He knows where you're going to fall. He knows where you're going to get mad. He knows who can press your buttons. He knows who's going to make you angry. He knows who's going to make you happy. He knows who will turn on you. And he'll put you two together eventually. Somewhere down the road, he'll put you together. And you'll have a confrontation. Oh, yes, I found the zinc in his armor. So we have to be careful of that. Um, today, if you have time, uh, Christ Object Lessons 222. Uh, Christ object lessons about this very subject that we're talking about, our weaknesses, and also about, about the wedding garment, is very, very good. And uh, I would suggest that you read that in its entirety. Um, so, are you really sure about your relationship with God? Can you say that I'm saved, I'm holy, I'm pure, 
and I'm righteous. If you really look at yourself and you think you've studied hard and you know God, can you say that to him yet? Can you stand before the creator of the universe and his son and say that I'm pure and I'm holy and I'm righteous? I've done all these things in your name. So let's, let's examine ourselves in the pure light, the holy light of God's character. That's the only thing we can measure with today. We cannot measure on worldly standards about, oh, these people sing well at church, or these people really give a good sermon, or, or oh, those are godly people. They do so many things for the Lord. We need not to be looking at other people. We need to look only at ourselves. Folks, time is so short that we don't have time to look around. The game is over. That's just like when you put a quarter in one of those machines when I was a kid and I'd play the, what do you want to call them now, the ping pong machine or whatever it was, and then it would say, tink, time out, or game over. That's my last quarter. It's all over. When my brother-in-law died in the hospital, his wife came into the room and she said, is that all? It's, all, it's over? My husband just died. It's, I mean, it's over in the blink of an eye. I'll never forget what she said. It's all over? Too late. You know, I feel sorry for her. She wanted to get something to eat. And he passed away while she was gone. And that's tough. That's tough to swallow. When you're loving, you've been with them, you know, day in and day out and helping and blah, 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 blah. And you go, you know, I'm exhausted. I need to go get something to eat. And there he goes, he, he may not live until you get back. I'm not criticizing. She was hungry. I mean, she had to go. But just to come back and know that he had just passed just a few minutes before. You mean, it's, it's, he's gone? It's all over? But that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes. Those that are righteous, let them be righteous still. Those that are filthy, let them be filthy still. And I don't want to be in the filthy side. Please remember one thing. God loves you and he loves myself more than anything in the world. There's nothing in this world that can keep you apart except you. Satan cannot keep you from God. He can harass you. Look at Job. Satan went back to heaven where the sons of God had all gathered for a conference. And God said to him, Where, where'd you come from? Oh, I came from the earth. He didn't say this, but he said, as I have dominion, where I have availability, you know, to do what I want to. He said, I came from walking the earth. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? Now, he didn't say, but God did not boast. He just says, have you considered him? He's a righteous man. I know that you've been out there trying to subvert everything. But have you considered him? He said, yeah, I know all about him. You've made him rich, prosperous, has a lot of family, a lot of goats, a lot of camels. And it's only because he has those good things that he praises you. You take away all of his goods, all of them, and he'll curse your face. That's the only time I know of in the Bible that Satan was absolutely dead wrong. God knew him and Job knew God. They had a, a they had a pure relationship. He was not going to be swayed from that. Even his wife said, "Just curse God and die. Let's get on with this stuff. I can't live like this. My daughters, my sons are dead. Camels are gone. The wealth is gone. I'm not going to get a new dress next week. And you're out here half naked with with dust all over the top of you, and you're scraping sores off the top of your head. Come on, get with it. Just curse God and let's die. Let's let's move on." He's not going to do anything for you. And he said, no, as long as I have breath. God giveth and God taketh away. So what happens? Satan comes back for another round in heaven. And God says the same thing to him. Where have you been? I've been on the earth. He said, have you considered my servant Job? He said, I did. He said, but I'll tell you what. If you took away um, other things from him, like his, you know, you'll see him curse you. And he said, okay, you can do anything you want to. You take away his health. You can do whatever you think. You're in charge of his life, but don't take it. 
You can make him miserable. You want to take that away from him? So God allowed it. He didn't say go give him boils. But he knew what Satan wanted to do. And even through all of that, Job would not, would not cave. So do we want to be a Job? Or do we want to be someone who is willy-nilly and uncertain about our character versus God's character? All we have to do is examine God's character. Let God take care of us and change us. Because we cannot change ourselves. We'll make more mistakes and Satan will wear us out long before we can ever change our character. That is never going to happen. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. But where does sanctification come from? It doesn't come from me. It's a free gift. It's something that God wishes for us to have. <clears throat> so, I guess we should say in the post note, psst, psst, Satan is eating you alive one bite at a time. Just like an elephant. Somebody says, how do I eat an elephant? And the guy says, one bite at a time. He does not care about your spirituality. At this point, he's not concerned about that because you'll lose your spirituality if he can affect you where he knows that you're the weakest. So keep that in the forefront of your mind. So would you say that, that of all the things in this world, um, that, that Satan would be called your arch nemesis? And, and somebody asked me the other day, he said, well, what is an arch nemesis? Well, it's, it's someone who has the same power that you do, but they use it in a different way. They, they think on a different frequency, but they know and understand you, and they know and understand how they can get you in trouble with your boss. Uh, they may be in the same office with you. They may be in the same church with you, but they make your life miserable. They know the task that you're on and the course that you're on, and they're not so much opposed to it as they're opposed to you. And if they can weaken you in some way through gossip or through, or through intimidation or through tripping you up and causing you to, uh, to sin, it's just another feather in their hat. So that's really is, is the bottom line for an arch nemesis. Someone who can and will subvert. And they do it on a daily basis. That's what they get, that's what they get their, 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 their pridefulness about is that they've toppled you and you and you and you and me. So we need to make sure that we're not um, falling to that. So he knows your spiritual values. He's, he's content right now with that. He just wants to eliminate all of your issues. So we need to admit our, our weak points and let God have them. Uh, he'll only take it from us if we'll let him. God will only take what you give. He will not take away your sinfulness. Those, that's yours. You inherited that. That's, that's, that's part of your character. God will take it away if you say, I don't want this. Please take it from me. God says, willing. I'll take that from you. And he's so willing to do that that he's willing to take it and remember it no more. How many people have wronged you and you've forgiven them but you still remember? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Everybody can attest to that. Very few people have got depth of character enough to say, that person wronged me and hurt me financially or whatever and asked for forgiveness and I knew that they were honest in their asking so I granted that forgiveness, and it's, it's over with. There's never, ever another mention of it, or not even a thought in your mind. But that's where it goes with God. It doesn't go in the piggy bank, in the, bed, the black piggy bank. Did you know that? People think that God has a black piggy bank back here, and that all your sins are committed, though you said you're sorry, you keep committing the same sin. He just keeps depositing in that black one. And at the end of time, he breaks it up and goes, oh, guess what? I know you're not. Surprise. He's not that way at all. But people want you to believe that, especially Satan wants you to believe that. It's not true. God says, I will forgive you. And then he'll throw it in the depths of the sea. And I don't know who, I mean, I, I can't dredge it up if it's gone to the bottom of the sea. So we need to be thinking like God thinks about our fellow people in church, is that when they say, I'm sorry, and you know that they're sorry, you forgive them and it's gone. And don't hold it back and then 10 years later, at a board meeting and say, well, I remember when you did or do remember. God does not do that. So we need not do that in ourselves. Okay, so he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we're unrighteous and our righteousness is as filthy rags, we still need righteousness in our life, right? 
So where do we get it? From Christ. How many agree with that statement? If you don't have Christ's righteousness, you have nothing. You have no righteousness. And, uh, and you want to uh, take a look at that real close. You want to go to uh, 1 John 1, 9. And you can do that this afternoon. Um, I think that you'll, you'll get a clearer, a clearer view of what God has in store for you. Uh, our closing song is Near to the Heart of God. And... Uh, my closing prayer I'll uh, <clears throat> leave myself and you with a challenge for the day let us be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving our own selves you can read that in James 1 2, 22, 1 22 of James Father thank you so much for your love for us and though we can't even hardly see that there's light at the end of the tunnel sometimes there will be a brightness that will be shown from one side of the world to the next and that will be the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're not prepared now, we need to start preparing. We can't trifle with the world. We can't trifle with our sins. We can't, we can't any longer delay. We need to get serious about examining ourselves in the light of your character. You've loved us so much that you're willing to pay the ultimate price. And not only pay the ultimate price, you're begging us, you're pleading with us, you're saying, please, I want to give you a beautiful white robe and my son will present it to you if you'll just give me your heart. So help us to become near to the heart of God, to you, and that we would have full joy and that we could have release from all of the sin and weariness in the world. We pray for each one here. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for those that are in the church, not in the church, our community and our leaders. Give us the boldness to step forward and shed sin off of us and then go tell others what God has done and win, win the world to you. For this is the great commission that we do this, but we can't do it in our state. So we pray that you would subdue the devil and give us time to breathe, think, and move forward in Christ's name. For it's in his name that we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen.